From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Estamos aguardando que os acusados... We are awaiting... Mostrem... The accusers... For the accusers to show at least some piece of evidence that indicates that I committed any crime during the period that I was in the presidency. Está por distrair disso. Now, what is behind that is the attempt to criminalize my political party. In a Democracy Now! exclusive, former Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva for the hour. The leader, President Barack Obama, once called the most popular politician on earth, is now running again for president of Brazil. He's the current frontrunner, but he may soon be heading to jail instead on what supporters say are trumped-up corruption charges. This comes just two years after Lula's close ally, Brazilian president, his successor Dilma Rousseff, was impeached in what many considered to be a coup. Is the future of democracy at stake in Brazil? We'll talk with him about his case, plus today's 15th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And he'll discuss U.S. interference in Latin America and last week's assassination of Rio de Janeiro city council member and human rights activist Marielle Franco. It's clear that her death was a premeditated killing. Now, I don't know if it was a militia or a police, but what is clear is that it is unacceptable. Former Brazilian president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, popularly known as Lula for the hour. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In a startling revelation about the 2016 U.S. election, it's been revealed that a voter profiling company named Cambridge Analytica harvested the data of more than 50 million Facebook users without their permission, in efforts to sway voters to support President Donald Trump. Cambridge Analytica was founded by billionaire Robert Mercer. Trump's former adviser, Steve Bannon of Breitbart News, was one of the company's key strategists. The Facebook data was first obtained by a Cambridge University academic named Alexander Kogan, whose company, Global Science Research, built an app that paid Facebook users to take a personality test and agree to have their data collected. The app also collected the data of these users' friends, meaning it actually collected data from tens of millions of users without their knowledge. Cambridge Analytica then bought this data in order to turn a voter profiling company into to a powerful psychological tool, which began launching targeted political ads aimed at carrying out Robert Mercer's far-right political agenda. This is whistleblower Christopher Wiley, who worked with Alexander Kogan to obtain the data from Facebook. It was a gross, grossly unethical experiment, because you are playing with an entire country the psychology of an entire country without their consent or awareness. And not only are you, like, playing with the psychology of, of an entire nation, you're playing with the psychology of an entire nation in the context of the demo democratic process. The London Observer, The Guardian and The New York Times all helped break the story. The revelations of the massive data breach and its role in the 2016 election has caused widespread backlash from both U.S. and British lawmakers, who are now calling on Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg to testify. This firestorm comes after Facebook has already faced massive backlash over how the platform was used to spread Russian propaganda ahead of the election. President Trump attacked special counsel Robert Mueller for the first time by name on Twitter over the weekend. On Saturday, he wrote, quote, The Mueller probe should never have been started and that there was no collusion and there was no crime, unquote. On Sunday, Trump tweeted, Why does the Mueller team have 13 hardened Democrats, some big crooked Hillary supporters and zero Republicans? Another Dem recently added, Does anyone think this is fair? And yet, there is no collusion, Trump tweeted. Mueller 
Taylor is a longtime Republican and a former FBI director who was appointed by Republican President George W. Bush. Trump's first attacks on Mueller came only one day after Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe was fired late Friday. Trump had repeatedly attacked McCabe, who was fired after Attorney General Jeff Sessions rejected an appeal that would have let him retire this weekend, meaning McCabe would have received his full pension. McCabe was fired for, quote, lack of candor about a conversation he authorized between a journalist and FBI officials. McCabe denies these allegations and says his firing is aimed at discrediting Robert Mueller's investigation, in which he's a potential witness. He also says he took extensive notes about his conversations with President Trump. A slew of Democratic lawmakers have offered to hire McCabe for two days in order to allow him to be eligible to receive his full pension. He was fired 48 hours before uh, he was to actually retire and be able to get that full pension. In Syria, Turkish soldiers and Turkish-backed Syrian fighters seized control of the Syrian Kurdish city of Afrin Sunday after a two-month Turkish assault on Afrin. The takeover expands Turkey's territory control in northern Syria and deals a blow to Kurdish efforts to achieve autonomy. Activists say hundreds of civilians have been killed in the offensive, which has also forced thousands to flee. On Sunday, dozens of Kurdish and leftist groups in Turkey demanded the international community pressure Turkey to withdraw from Afrin. This is Turkish lawmaker Berdan Öztürk. We call on the United Nations, the European Council, the European Parliament, international coalition forces, Islamic countries and the international community as a whole to take steps to immediately avert the tragedy in Afrin and get concrete results, including withdrawal of all armed forces who entered Afrin. In more news from Syria, war monitors report at least 30 people were killed on Saturday amidst the ongoing Syrian government's bombing and ground offensive against eastern Ghouta, outside the capital, Damascus. Thousands of civilians have been fleeing the assault on the suburb, which was controlled by rebel groups. On Sunday, Syrian state TV broadcast video of Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad visiting troops on the front lines in eastern Ghouta. In Russia, President Vladimir Putin has won another six-year term. Official results show Putin won 76 percent of the vote. His main challenger, opposition leader Alexei Navalny, was barred from running. After the results were announced, Putin was questioned by reporters about whether he'd run again six years from now. I believe that what you're saying is a little funny. Let's count. Will I be sitting here in power until I'm 100 years old? No, no. Officials from North Korea, South Korea and the United States are slated to meet in Finland this week to talk about reducing the threat of nuclear war. It's not yet announced who will be attending the meeting, but Finnish officials say the U.S. representatives are non-government officials. In Afghanistan, at least eight civilians were killed before dawn Saturday morning, when elite members of the U.S.-backed Afghan intelligence agency opened fire from a helicopter on farmers irrigating the fields below. One of the victims' brothers says they were killed, still holding their shovels. The youngest victim was 14 years old. One local politician told The New York Times these types of raids are usually carried out with the assistance of U.S.-led NATO coalition. In Kashmir, at least five members of the same family were killed Sunday, as India and Pakistan both fired across the line of control that divides this disputed territory. The victims were a couple and their three children, who were gathering for breakfast when a mortar shell hit their home. The youngest victim was eight years old. Meanwhile, a Kashmiri photojournalist named Kanran Yusuf has been released after being jailed for six months on charges of waging war against India. He was the first Kashmiri journalist to be arrested and held by India's National Investigation investigation agency, which was formed in 2009, to fight terrorism. In Texas, two people were injured Sunday night, when a package exploded in southwest Austin. It's the fourth package explosion in Austin this month. The explosions have killed two members of prominent African-American families and seriously injured a third Latina woman. Authorities say the bombings may be hate crimes and that Sunday's explosion is likely linked to the first three.
In Texas, a 23-year-old Salvadoran asylum seeker named Laura Monterosa has been released from the T. Don Hutto detention facility after a national campaign to win her freedom. Monterosa says she was sexually assaulted by a guard while in detention and was then placed in solitary confinement in retaliation for speaking up. She fled El Salvador to escape sexual persecution as a lesbian and has been detained for nine months. And computer hacker Adrian Lamo has died at the age of 37. He's best known for hacking the computer networks of major corporations, including The New York Times, Yahoo and Microsoft, and for reporting U.S. Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning to authorities after the two became friends online. Lamo's body was discovered in an apartment on Wednesday in Wichita, Kansas, the cause of his death unknown. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Brazilians continue to mourn the loss of 38-year-old Rio de Janeiro City Council member and human rights activist Marielle Franco. Franco was assassinated, along with her driver, last Wednesday night, after a pair of gunmen riddled her car with bullets as she returned from an event on the topic of empowering black women. Franco, who is a black lesbian, was known for her fierce criticism of police killings in Brazil's impoverished favela neighborhoods. The night before her death, Franco wrote on Twitter, how many more must die for this war to end? In January alone, government figures show police killed 154 people in Rio State. Franco's death comes at a pivotal moment for Brazil and the future of democracy in South America's largest country. Just last month, President Michel Temer ordered Brazil's military to assume control of police duties in Rio. Two years ago, Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff of the Workers' Party was impeached by the Brazilian Senate in a move she denounced as a coup. Brazil is holding elections later this year. The frontrunner is Rousseff's ally, former Brazilian president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, commonly known as Lula. While he's leading all opinion polls, he's facing a possible prison sentence after being convicted on what many believe to be trumped-up charges of corruption and money laundering. Last year, President Rousseff said, quote, the first chapter of the coup was my impeachment, but there's a second chapter, and that is stopping President Lula from becoming a candidate for next year's elections, Rousseff said. British human rights attorney Jeffrey Robertson told The New Internationalist that, quote, extraordinarily aggressive measures are being taken to put Lula in jail, quote, by the judiciary, by the media, by the great sinews of wealth and power in Brazil, unquote. Lula is a former union leader who served as president of Brazil from 2003 to 2010. During that time, he helped lift tens of millions of Brazilians out of poverty. President Barack Obama once called him the most popular politician on earth. Well, late Friday, I had a chance to speak with Lula. He was in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I began by asking him about the assassination of Rio City Councilwoman Marielle Franco. Amy, we have two problems in Brazil. The first is that her assassination is unacceptable, the assassination of Marielle, a young woman. The only thing that she uh, did was to work against the assassinations of black persons in the peripheral areas in the defense of human rights and the defense of the lives of people. It's clear that her death was a premeditated killing. Now, I don't know if it was a militia or a police, but what is clear is that it is unacceptable and that all of us Brazilians should come together in a single voice and shout out loud to immediately demand punishment of those responsible for that killing. And President Temer should have learned a great lesson with this killing, which is that the problem of violence in the peripheral areas of our Brazil is not going to be resolved 
by turning to the armed forces. It is necessary that the state have a presence in the peripheral neighborhoods of Brazil with jobs, education, health care, cultural activities, employment and salary so that people can survive and live with dignity. The armed forces were not trained to deal with common crime in the favelas in Brazil. Elas foram preparadas para defender o nosso país. They were trained to defend our country from outside enemies. Veja, quando, quando as pessoas entenderem... In other words, when people understand that violence in Brazil is associated with the very poor quality of life that people are subjected to and the lack of uh, proper living conditions for people living in peripheral areas, then there will be less violence in the peripheral areas, especially against children, young people and black people in our country. The case of Marielle is an emblematic case because it requires all democratic-minded persons in the world, all those who love life. All those who love freedom and all of those who struggle for human rights, all should protest loudly so that the assassins of Marielle are put in prison and are given exemplary punishment. That's what we all want. Cecilia Oliveira of The Intercept on Twitter tweeted, the lot of 9 millimeter ammo used in the execution of Marielle Franco and Anderson Pedro was purchased by the federal police and matches casings found at the scene of the Osasco massacre that killed 19 in Sao Paulo in 2015. Two cops and one municipal guard were convicted. Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept then tweeted, to the surprise of absolutely nobody, the preliminary evidence is establishing links between the police and the assassins who killed Marielle Franco. Nothing is conclusive yet at all in this regard, but the preliminary evidence is pointing straight in that direction. Do you agree with this, President Lula? And what do you think needs to be done immediately right now of thousands, as thousands of people have taken to the streets? Look, the first thing is, if it is true that the weapon that killed Marielle was a weapon purchased by the federal police and that was already used in another massacre here in Sao Paulo two years ago, then we would have a very strong indication. We must know whether at some point in time, during that period between the massacre in Sao Paulo and the killing of Marielle, whether the federal police denounced that any weapons had been or, or munitions had been stolen from the federal police. Or, if there was a robbery and the munitions or weapons were purchased by the federal police, it's necessary that the federal police explain to Brazilian society why is it that those weapons were in the hands of the assassins. So, if there needs to be clarification with this evidence, if the weapons were stolen, and they did not denounce it because they were ashamed that weapons had been stolen from the federal police. Well, in this case, Amy, it's very important that people be careful to make sure they're not making untrue uh, uh, accusations or accusations looking for a headline. Now, what is true is that for the police, for the armed forces, for the government, for the police intelligence, it should be able to, in the shortest time possible, they should figure out who the assassins were and then punish those assassins. 
former Brazilian president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. He's now running again for president and is the current frontrunner, but may soon be heading to jail. We'll continue our interview with Lula in a minute and ask him about the charges against him, which his supporters say are politically motivated, and also talk with him about U.S. intervention in Latin America, about this 15th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, and much more. Stay with us. Meu choro não é nada além de carnaval É lágrima de samba na ponta dos pés A multidão avança como um vendaval Me joga na avenida que não sei qual é Pirata e super-homem tentam o calor Um peixe amarelo beija minha mão As asas de um anjo soltas pelo chão The Woman at the End of the World by the Brazilian singer Elza Soares. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, as we continue our exclusive, a conversation with Brazil's former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, popularly known as Lula. The highly popular former union leader is running for president in this year's election, but is facing a possible prison term on what many believe to be trumped-up corruption charges tied to a sprawling probe known as Operation Car Wash. Lula was convicted of accepting a beachside apartment from an engineering firm vying for contracts at the state oil company Petrobras, but many of Lula's supporters say the conviction was politically motivated. The Intercept recently reported, quote, the indictment against Lula is rife with problems. The apartment's title was never transferred to Lula or his associates. He and his wife never used the property. The prosecution could not identify an explicit quid pro quo or benefit related to Petrobras. No official or internal documentation linking Lula to the apartment was produced, and the case rests almost entirely on the testimony of the executive who hoped to gain sentencing leniency for his cooperation." Unquote. During the interview on Friday, President Lula responded to the charges and conviction against him. Eu, eu não fui denunciado por corrupção. I was not accused of corruption. I was accused because of a lie. Uma mentira do inquérito policial. In a police investigation. A lie in an indictment by the office of the attorney general and in the judgment of Judge Moro. Porque só tem uma prova em todo esse processo que é a prova da minha inocência. Only one evidence of my evi uh, innocence in this entire trial. Que, que meus advogados de defesa fizeram de forma magistral. Which my defense counsel explained in a magisterial manner. We are awaiting. Mostre the accusers, for the accusers to show at least some piece of evidence that indicates that I committed any crime during the period that I was in the presidency. Now, what is behind that is the attempt to criminalize my political party. What is behind that? is the interest in a part of the political elite of Brazil, together with a part of the press, reinforced by the role of the judiciary in preventing Lula from becoming a candidate in the 2018 elections. E eu continuo desafiando a Polícia Federal and I continue challenging the federal police, the office of the attorney general. I continue challenging Judge Moro and the appellate court to show the world and to show Brazil a single piece of evidence of a crime committed by me. Porque o comportamento do Poder Judiciário nesse instante. The behavior of the judiciary in this instance is a political form of behavior. Mr. President, last year, the ousted president, Dilma Rousseff, said the first chapter of the coup was my impeachment, but there's a second chapter, and that's stopping President Lula from becoming a candidate for next year's elections. Do you see it the same way? that this is the final chapter of the coup. 
if you your conviction is upheld that you will be prevented from running in the October elections. O o M, o o o o PT ele conseguiu fazer em 12 Amy, anos the de Workers Brasil, Party in 12 years in the government at the helm of the government in Brazil que não tinha sido feito was able to do many things that had never been done at any time in the 20th century. Neste país em 12 anos nós delevamos 40 milhões de pessoas This country in 12 years we brought 40 million people into the middle class. Nós tiramos 36 milhões de pessoas da miséria. We drew 36 million people out of poverty. Enquanto a Europa desempregava 62 milhões de postos de trabalho, well, a partir de 2008, Europe was shedding 62 million jobs. As of uh, 2008, we created 20 million jobs in the formal sector in this country. For 12 years, all Brazilian workers had, uh, were able to overcome inflation. É, foi o maior momento de crescimento econômico da história do Brasil. It was the time of the greatest economic growth in the history of Brazil. It was the most distribution of income in the history of Brazil. To give you an idea, in 12 years, 70 million people began to use the banking system who had never walked into a bank. Ao depor a Dilma, eles não iam querer que o Lula votasse, porque eles sabem And que when a they got rid of Dilma, they did want Lula to come back because they know that the relationship between the Brazilian people and President Lula was the strongest relationship that the people of Brazil had ever had with a president in the entire history of the country. E mais importante, M, eles sabem And que even more important, tenho a certeza absoluta they know I am absolutely certain that the best way to ensure economic recovery in Brazil is to lift up the working people of this country. They know that I know how to do that. Now that the poor people had jobs, had a salary, were studying, were eating better, were living, had better housing. When that happens, the economy grows again, and we can become the most optimistic country in the world and the happiest people in the world. Por isso, Amy, eu quero ser candidato a presidente da República. Amy, that is why I want to be candidate for the presidency of Brazil. Torneiro mecânico. To show. Para provar que um torneiro mecânico that a mechanic who doesn't have a university degree knows better how to take care of the Brazilian people than the Brazilian elite, who never looked after the welfare of the Brazilian people. President Lula, why did you decide to run for president again? The truth is, I have still not decided, Amy. The ones who are deciding are the Brazilian people. Veja todas as pesquisas de opinião Look, pública que all são of the no Brasil, public opinion polls in Brazil, pesquisas, month after month, and there are several of them, em lugar, in all of them, pesquisas, I'm in first place. A ser o que tem o and so eleição, I'm beginning to be the candidate who has the lowest negatives and the possibility of becoming a, a candidate and winning on the first round. And this is making my adversaries very uncomfortable. And I'm sure, Amy, that at the Supreme Court, I will be acquitted and that I will be candidate and Brazil could once again be a protagonist in international policy, the economy could grow again, create jobs and improve the quality of life of the people. This is something I know how to do very well. If the case does not go well for you in the Supreme Court, would you consider stepping aside? First of all, Amy, I'm very optimistic. 
very optimistic. Now, if that were to happen and I was not able, were not able to be a candidate, if my name is not on the ballot, tem que estar o nome e a, e a fotografia na cédula eletrônica aqui no Brasil. Portanto, eu acho que, se for o caso, o partido irá convocar uma convenção e irá discutir o que, que vai fazer. A convenção e discutir o que fazer. Eu, eu vou brigar até o fim, vou brigar acreditando que se fará justiça neste país. I am going to uh, require that and call for justice to be done in the country. Now, if my innocence uh, is proven, then Judge Moro should be removed from his position, because you can't have a judge who is lying in the judgment and uh, pronouncing as guilty someone who he knows is innocent. He knows that it's not my apartment. He knows that I didn't buy it. He knows that I didn't pay anything. He knows that I never went there. He knows that I don't have money from Petrobras. The thing is that because he subordinated himself to the media, I said in the first hearing with him, you are not in a position to acquit me because the lies have gone too far. And the disgrace is that the one who tells the first lie continues lying and lying and lying to justify the first lie. And I'm going to prove that he has been lying. Well, you raised two issues, President Lula, the media as prosecutor and the judge as prosecutor. Can you talk about both? Start with the media. Não, deixa, o Amy, é importante que se venha ao Brasil. Well, Amy, it's important that you come to Brazil to see what's happening with the Brazilian press. Eu, eu fui, eu fui presidente oito anos. I was president for eight years. Dilma was president for four years. durante doze anos. And for twelve years. outra coisa não ser tentar destruir. All the press did was to try to destroy my image and her image and the image of my party. Eu, 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 eu tenho mais matérias negativas contra mim. I have more negative subject matter about me in the leading television news program of Brazil than all of the presidents in the whole history of Brazil. In other words, it's a daily attempt to massacre me, to tell untruths about Lula, about Lula's family. And the only weapon that I have is to confront them. And they're irritated because after they massacred me for four years, any opinion poll by any polling institute showed that Lula was going to win the elections in Brazil. Segundo M, o Ministério Público da Lava Jato. Eu respeito now, muito second, the Office of the Attorney General and the Car Wash Scandal. I recommend, I, I respect very much the institution. E ajudei a reforçar o papel do Ministério Público. I was a con Mas member of the Constitutional Ministério Assembly, Público and I helped to strengthen the role of the Office um, of the Attorney um, General. Uma But it tarefa, created a task force uh, organizada por um promotor organized que foi para by a prosecutor who went to television to show a PowerPoint and said that the PT, the Workers' Party, was established to be a criminal organization, that the fact that Lula was the most important person in the PT meant that he was the head of a criminal organization. And on concluding the indictment, he simply said the following. Não me peçam provas. Não me peçam provas. I don't have convicção. evidence. I don't have evidence. I have conviction. Eu não quero ser julgado pela convicção do promotor. Ele guarde para ele as suas convicções. I don't want to be judged by the conviction of the prosecutor. He can keep his convictions to himself. I want whoever is prosecuting me to come forward in the proceeding and to tell the people of Brazil what crime I committed.
que eu agora estou the querendo de verdade only thing, é Amy, that I really want o now do meu processo seja is julgado. for the merits of my trial to be judged. I want him to discuss it. I want him to read the uh, prosecutorial brief and the defense brief, and then make a decision. Eu, na verdade, o que eu quero nesse momento What I really want at this time is that justice be done in this country. The candidate polling second in Brazil's elections is a far right wing congressman and former soldier named Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, he's been called the Brazilian Trump. Can you talk about who he is, what he represents? And if you understand there's any communication between him and the U.S. government right now. I cannot. I cannot level accusations against an adversary. The only thing that I would like is to have the right to run in the elections here in Brazil, to win the elections. O direito do povo brasileiro viver and to uh, recover the right of the Brazilian people to live well. I cannot pass judgment on the president of the United States, just as I cannot pass judgment on the president of Uruguay, and much less uh, can I pass judgment on my adversaries. But if you can explain what he represents, how you differ from him. No, he is a deputy federal, Amy. He is a member of the Federal Congress. He is a, was an army a captain in the Brazilian Army. The information that we have is that he was expelled from the Brazilian Army. And he, he is, his behavior is uh, right, far right wing, fascist. He is very much prejudiced against women, against blacks, against indigenous persons, against human rights. He believes that everything can be resolved with violence. So I don't think he has a future in Brazilian politics. He has the right to run. He speaks. He, he projects a certain image that, to please a part of the society that is of the extreme right. But I don't believe that the Brazilian people have an interest in electing someone with his sort of behavior to serve as president of the republic. Do you think he was happy with Marielle's death? I think so, because he's preaching violence every day. He preaches violence. He believes that those who defend human rights are doing a disservice to democracy. He thinks that those who defend women's rights are doing a disservice to uh, democracy. Likewise, those who defend the rights of the black community. He is against everything. Quando, quando se discuta a questão de direitos humanos. Uh, that is discussed when one is talking about human rights. We continue with Brazilian presidential candidate, former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, in 30 seconds. Desesperar jamais Aprendemos muito Anos, afinal de contas, não tem cabimento Entregar o jogo no primeiro tempo Nada de corrente. Never Despair by Brazilian singer Ivan Lins. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman, who's returned to our conversation with the former Brazilian president, the current presidential candidate, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Mr. President, I want to ask you about what's happened in Honduras, with the Organization of American States uh, saying that the election there of the incumbent President Hernandez was deeply flawed, with the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, going to Honduras. Clearly, the uh, ambassador there, the U.S. representative there, deeply involved in what has taken place with the swearing-in of the president before a correction of the elections. Um, your thoughts on what's happened in Honduras, the U.S. involvement there, and also the U.S. attitude towards—the U.S. actions towards Venezuela. 
um, putting certain Venezuelan leaders on a list of those banned from entering the United States and taking other punitive measures against Maduro, President Maduro. O, o, o M, uh, é, é, é bastante visível. Amy, it's quite visible that the United States is interfering in the countries of Central America. It's not just today that there's U.S. interference. In many countries of Central America, the U.S. ambassador behaves as though they were elected by the far right in the countries of our dear Central America. What I deeply regret is that the United States has not learned to live democratically with the countries of Central America and with the countries of Latin America. In January of 2003, in, Amy, in January of 2003, I had been president of the Republic for less than one month, and there was already a conflict underway between the United States and Venezuela. And I was in Ecuador, participating in the inauguration of the president of Ecuador, when I met with Chavez. And I proposed the creation of a group of friends of Venezuela so as to be able to guarantee democracy in Venezuela. I told the United States that uh, they should participate in the group. Colin Powell participated in the group, and I also uh, got Spain involved, and Aznar participated in the group. Why? Because Spain had been the first country to recognize the coup, and the United States was accused of being involved in the coup. And I put uh, Brazil and Argentina there, and I think France as well. And we were able to give Venezuela a time of peace, be able to hold elections. And something like that should happen today. Self-determination of the peoples is a sacred matter. É direito dos Estados Unidos tomar a decisão que bem entender a respeito dos Estados Unidos. Right of the United States. The United States has right to decide matters pertaining to the United States. That is called sovereignty. And it is up to Venezuela to make the decision within the sovereignty of Venezuela. Fazer com que o presidente Bush se reunisse com o presidente Chávez. I, several times, did what I could to get President Bush to meet with President Chávez. Na primeira reunião que o presidente Obama foi a Trindade Tobago, logo no primeiro ano da posse dele. When Pre President Obama was recently in power, he went to Trinidad and Tobago, and then we had a meeting with him and with Chávez, trying to create the conditions for the United States to have a more peaceful relationship with Venezuela. But it seems to me that it's not possible. There's a certain irrationality at the U.S. State Department that doesn't want to negotiate peace in Venezuela. And, and, but we need to understand that if Central America grows, it's going to improve the economic situation generally. No one wants to see democracy at risk anywhere in the world. And that is why I regret that there's not understanding on the part of the United States with respect to Venezuela. The U.S. CIA, U.S. government, is well known to have been involved in the 1964 coup in Brazil. Do you see any evidence of that, both in the ouster of President Dilma Rousseff and also your own case? Do you see any evidence of foreign involvement, particularly the U.S.? Olha, levou quase 40 anos para ficar provado que well, it took almost 40 years to prove that the United States indeed did participate in the 1964 coup. 
Embora não seja defensor da teoria da conspiração. Now, even though I am not a defender of uh, conspiracy theories, I am convinced. A gente nos Estados Unidos que não aceita o protagonismo do Brasil people na política in the United externa. States, uh, some don't accept Brazil playing such a proactive role a, in foreign a, a policy. Interesse, há interesses extraordinários na nossa Petrobras. There are extraordinary interests in our Petrobras, and there is interest in Brazil's influence in Latin America and in South America. Há interesses que não dê certo, sabe, o funcionamento dos BRICS e a criação dos BRICS. Not e wanting to necessarily see the bank of the BRICS countries go forward. Todo santo dia, a relação do Ministério Público Brasileiro e do Jus Moro com And o Ministério Público Americano. Uh, there is the Brazilian press always talks about the close relationship between the uh, Office of Attorney General in the in Brazil and the Department of Justice in the United States around Petrobras issues. And we are trying to investigate Brazilian legislators go to the U.S. Congress. They talk with U.S. Congresspersons. Queremos continuar trabalhando para que o Brasil seja we, um país soberano. And all we want is to continue seja, working so that Brazil um will be a sovereign country. Que saiba utilizar a country o that potencial de knows que o Brasil tem how to use its tremendous potential for development to benefit fico, the people of Brazil. Eu fico me perguntando todo dia. I ask myself every day. Who would be interested in trying to destroy Petrobras? Who would be interested in destroying Brazil's engineering industry? Who would be interested in destroying the largest company in protein in the world here in Brazil? Uh, who is interested in fracking in Brazil? Mr. President, Monday marks the 15th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. You oppose that invasion. Your thoughts today, with the U.S. continuing in its presence in both Iraq as well as in Afghanistan? Uh, oh, Amy. Eu, eu, eu lamento profundamente porque no dia 10 de dezembro de 2002, I, Amy, I am so sorry that on December 10th, 2002, I spoke with President Bush at the White House. And I uh, told him that Iraq did not have chemical weapons because the head of the international agency was a Brazilian ambassador Bustani. O presidente dos Estados Unidos, mas o primeiro ministro da Inglaterra, e o primeiro ministro da Grande Bretanha, told the world a lie, saying that there were chemical weapons in Iraq. E o Saddam Hussein mentia ao mundo. And Saddam Hussein was lying to the world, pretending that he had them. Ter salvado o seu país da invasão americana. When Saddam Hussein could have uh, saved his country from the U.S. invasion by asking for uh, international então, presence to inspect. Mentiras. So, two lies. A do governo americano dizendo que tinha armas. The lie by the U.S. government saying there's chemical weapons. And the lie by Saddam Hussein pretending that he had them. E não resolveu o problema well, do terrorismo. These have led to the destruction of a country without resolving the problem of terrorism in the world. Eu acho que foi uma pena. I think it was a great shame. E it was a shame. Anos, e até agora, and so many years have gone by, and to this day, no one has been able to show anything of chemical weapons in Iraq. Me, me parece que a única arma química que tem no Iraque era o próprio it, Saddam Hussein. It seems to me uh, that the only uh, chemical weapons were just the, him pretending that there were, and then terrorism goes on.
President Lula, what is your assessment of President Donald Trump? Olha, eu, eu não tenho... I don't have an assessment. I think it's very unusual that there's a president of the republic in the most powerful country of the world who governs the country by Twitter. I find that very interesting. But in any event, I have to respect him, because he was elected by the people of the United States. And if he was elected by the people of the United States, then he is going to serve his term as he wishes, because the people of the United States gave him the authority to do so. I cannot be sitting in judgment of how Trump governs. He governs in his way, and we'll see how it goes. Your thoughts on President Trump calling Africa, Haiti, and other countries—well, uh, he called Africa a country—s-hole countries. I think that— if a person behaves that way in discussing relations with sister countries, then I don't think a person would really be qualified to be president of the country, even if in the United States. The countries that have no chance of growing economically must be treated with great respect. Amy, let me tell you one thing. If the rich countries, especially the United States, who have already spent more than $14 trillion to resolve the 2008 financial crisis with the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, instead of having used part of that money to help the countries of Africa to develop, well, had they done so, certainly Africa would be growing more, creating more jobs, strengthening democracy, and improving the lives of the people. The first meeting we had of the G 20 in London, there we suggested that the rich countries should make investments in the poor countries so as to create new industrialized regions in the world and new consumers in the world. Unfortunately, the rich countries are to uh, turn to protectionism once again and took a long time to resolve the crisis in two, of 2008. I wanted to read for you uh, from the Merco Press. It says, a controversial visit and meeting of two branches of government, the Brazilian government, was reported in the Brazilian media. In effect, last Saturday afternoon, President Michel Temer made a visit to the head of the federal Supreme Tribunal, Carmen Lucia, at her residence and was not conducted as part of the president's official schedule. I believe they were seen hugging. The visit took place five days after Supreme Judicial—the uh, visit took place five days after Supreme Tribunal Justice Luis Roberto Barroso allowed police to investigate Temer's financial records, the first time in the history of Brazilian Republic that an acting president has had his financial records opened by judicial order. You know, this was happening at about the same time that reports emerged that um, the U.S. special counsel, Robert Mueller, is looking into Trump family finances. But I wanted to ask you about this, because it's this Supreme Court in Brazil that will also be determining your fate. Is that right, President Lula? Look, first, I think that President Temer can meet with the justice, Carmen Lucia, either at her office at the Supreme Court or at his office in the presidency. But uh, they apparently had a secret meeting. Second, Amy, here in Brazil, we need to reestablish the functions of the institutions. Here in Brazil, 
Aqui no Brasil, a política está judicializada. Politics is uh, becoming channeled into the courts, and the courts are becoming politicized. E é preciso que as instituições voltem à normalidade. And each institution needs to go back to normalcy. The judiciary, through the Supreme Court, is a guarantor of the Constitution. An executive branch executes, carries out, and the legislative branch legislates. If we were to once again have a harmonious and respectful relationship, then we can have Brazil go back to normalcy. I, too. Well, very abnormal things have happened. There are judges uh, talking on television every day. There is a process of disrespecting institutions in Brazil. Part of the judiciary is on strike, they want a housing allowance of almost 4,600 reals. And these people earn 30,000 reals per month, so they don't need a housing allowance, like the Brazilian population who have no home. Those people need housing assistance. Eu tenho convicção, Amy, tenho certeza. So I have uh, the conviction, Amy, I am certain that it is possible to reestablish harmony in Brazil. I'm certain that it is possible to go back to a climate like we had in 2010, 2009, with everyone living harmoniously, people talking among one another, and everybody living democratically in diversity. President Lula, you could be arrested at any point. What will you do? At, I cannot be arrested at any moment. This thing about any moment is a desire on the part of my adversaries and my enemies. I can only be arrested if someone proves that I have committed a crime. I'm certain, Amy, as I speak with you right now, I have a perfect peace of mind as compared to those who are leveling accusations against me. I have the peace of mind of the innocent. Uh, you can rest assured that I have the peace of mind of uh, the, those who are innocent and those who are bringing accusations against me know that they're doing so on the basis of a lie, and therefore, I don't think that they are able to place their head on their pillow at night and sleep with the tranquility that I sleep with every day. Even if you continue to say you're innocent, a judge has a court has ruled that you are guilty and face what nearly 10 years in jail so even if you disagree with both the conviction and uh, the appeal being denied that has taken place would you resist arrest would you resist being jailed no eu trabalho com a hipótese de que no i'm working based on the hypothesis that there will be justice before having to make such a decision. I'm convinced, because— The only thing that I'm looking out for at this time is for them to judge my trial on the merits. The Supreme Court and the appellate court cannot let stand an untruth against the truth. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, president of Brazil from 2003 to 2010, Brazil, the sixth most populous country in the world. Lula is now running again for president. He is the current front-runner, unless the courts stop him.
and send him to jail. Special thanks to Charlie Roberts. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Gattesdiener, Sam Alkoff. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.